I think a lot of people, I saw a thread about how so many people like, um, it was like, you know, raise your hand if uh, you were influenced to start a business from this movie. And it showed screenshots of the social network movie. And I mean, for me, that was, you know, prime, prime time of when I was working on the apps and everything. And, and it was like, oh yeah, that is for sure what I, you know, everybody, everybody wants to do that, or at least in my, you know, in my circles. I mean, that movie was so well done. Even That even influenced me. You know, I mean, that was the, yeah. See, it came out in 2010. Yeah. So I was a, I was a sophomore in high school. That was the year that I was working on the app, the iPhone app. So I was like making the iPhone app, watching the social network, being like, oh, I want to be the next market. Like <laughs> playing the playlist, right? Oh, totally. Totally. Yep. yep. I still have that playlist. I have this one playlist called Code Monkey, right? Uh, and that that whole soundtrack is still on there with a bunch of other stuff as well. So. Yeah, hand, it's like Hand Meets Fist or something. Is that main? Is like the main title theme? I think. So, Ye- hand, so, no, it's like bru- hold on, because now I'm curious. Something, yeah, but it's the one where it's like something the like that. it's the the one with the tension and da da. Yep. Cue uh cue uh, cue music. <laughs> Hold on, now I need to know because I need to know what the first one is. Oh, the Steve, uh, the, do you have the, the Steve Jobs soundtrack is really good also, actually. Which one? The one with uh, Fastbender? Uh, yeah, exactly. Or Kutcher? Because there was like three or no, four movies good. that came <laughs> No, no, no. There was like three or four of those movies that came out like within a five year time period after he died. Yeah, exactly. I'm trying to capitalize. I think Ashton like looked more like him, but did a poor job, you know, capturing kind of the essence of, of Steve Jobs, or at least what was in the book. Where is yeah. The, the, the most recent one that I've seen of that, that reminds me of that is the Blackberry movie. Have you seen that one? Yeah. Yeah. That was a good one. Yeah. Um, with, uh, Glenn Howerton from it's always sunny. Oh, that's right. That is think- so funny. I didn't, I didn't think about how that was him and yeah. I realized it like consciously. Yeah, he plays the the neurotic CEO so well, like yeah, and going crazy. But yeah, that that was a really cool story because that that and again that was another one that I like lived through that period of time when yep same people around me were like just getting cell phones and oh switching over to you know touch screens and mm-hmm. hand covers bruise that's what it is hand covers okay yeah <laughs> it's like hand Which meets is even fist weird. yeah yeah I that's knew cool. it was like. Close. I knew of. it was something to do with bruise. Yeah, that's funny. That is it's such a good movie, though. To be honest, and the crazy. Someone said on Twitter the other day, "What did they say?" Uh, that when that movie came out, I oh, at, at the end of that movie, they show the revenue right of Facebook now. I think or something mm-hmm. like the number of users. And today, it's like a trillion. You know, it's it's insane the the amount of. But even back then, that was still impressive. The the stuff they had reached. Yeah. One, and now and it's just off the charts. One, it's it's jumped up a, a full letter. It's gone from a B to a T. Like, yep. you know, the that classic line, you know what's cool? A billion dollars. Well, you know, now it's cool. You know what's cool? A trillion dollars. Yeah, that classic. Same. That one of the most famous lines, I think, from that movie. Like that one line is probably what influenced so many people to, you know, go <laughs> into that that realm. Right, right. Yeah, I still use a variation of that line for like Twitter content every now and then. <laughs> you know what's cool? This. What do you think the next one will be? What do you think the next big like movie will be about? Probably AI stuff, right? It's, I, I know what it'll be. I know what the next big one will be. And, and it'll be crazy if they don't do this, but it'll be about the drama with OpenAI. Well, I was happens. thinking, I think it's going to be uh, SBF and crypto. I think they'll do. I think they'll do a movie on on probably both the wild wackiness of of that whole era of him going when to jail, giving. I mean, two year, last year, two years ago, because that all started in like 2017, right? I was in the middle of it in 2017. Yeah, I lost most of my money in crypto in like 2016, 2017, <laughs> when uh, Bitrex got got hacked. I think it was. It was uh, the and it was the day before Christmas. I remember on one of those. It was twenty fifteen or twenty sixteen. I think. I got so lucky because 
the, I can't even remember the name of the exchange, but it was like the Nano, it wasn't called Nano then, I think it was called Ryblox, or maybe it just be, had been called Nano. And it, well, I also got lucky though, because I cashed out, like December 2017 is when I cashed out most of the Bitcoin and just left the rest and, you know, um, in Ryblox or Nano as it came to be called. But the guy behind it, like there was a whole scandal about how he, either he didn't run the exchange properly or his code was bad or, or something, regardless, lost a lot of people's money. And I, I literally transferred the money from that exchange, the, na the nano coin, to another exchange right before it happened. And it wasn't like I anticipated that, I just got lucky. So, it's one of those things where, yeah, time, timed it right. Timed it right. Of course, that the value of that coin never went back up, right? Luckily, I got into it when it was so cheap that, you know, it, it was never it was never a big deal. It was only like a thousand dollars or something yeah. I put into it. Nothing crazy. It's funny how those are the those are the memories that stick out of of like those times versus all the other like losses or whatever. Like, it, it, it's like similar to like how, uh, like bragging about something that's super expensive versus bragging about how cheap you got something at, off as a discount. Right. <laughs> like. I always think that was, I always think that's a funny, that's a funny, uh, that's a funny line. What that you got something as a, like bragging about how cheap you got something. Yeah. Cause I'm always, I'm always more impressed with myself when I can go to the thrift store or something and find like, you know, a pair of shoes that's normally a hundred and something dollars or whatever for like 20 bucks. And to me, that's like a, a cooler brag than anything that's more like any, just ex something that's expensive. I don't know. It's almost like the tre it's like the treasure hunt. I could see that. Yeah, I don't go to a lot of thrift stores. Maybe I, maybe I should. I mean, maybe that's a good way to. I swear, my doppelganger lives in Vegas. <laughs> I've I've gotten okay. so many like brand new or like brand new Nike golf clothes, and I think it's because I've t I've told this to a couple of people before, but I think it's because people come to Vegas, mm -hmm. and they just show up with nothing like no luggage or anything how they, is that possible you know certain certain lifestyles of people you know like traveling <laughs> you know traveling i don't know happens it clearly happens because i think like they they'll buy just stuff and then it it gets left in the hotel room and then per policy of the hotel they donate it to uh to charity so they can get the tax write-off but then it go it goes to charity, which then funnels down to a local, you know, goodwill near you. And the one by, you know, the one, the couple, the couple uh, goodwills near me have been like just hitting with brand new Nike golf <laughs> stuff and like shoe and, you know, brand new Adidas shoes. And it's like how, you know, and in my size, which is so weird. That is crazy. I am so like, I could never, I don't know if I don't, maybe not never, but I feel like that's so different from my personality to someone who shows up in Vegas with nothing and they just like right? buy it there and then leave it and leave it. I mean, how would you even, because something has to fit well, you know, you, you can't just, I don't know. I can't just walk into the downstairs, you know, but I guess that is the place to do it. Actually. Now that I think about it, they have tons of shops, right? Tons of shops. Super accessible. It's right there, yeah. you know. Huh. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not taking this, you know. Oh, this, this, you know. Yeah, I don't know. Wild. <laughs> or it could, be, it could even be more sinister. It could be that there's so many shirts popping up because people are just dying in Vegas. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> they come in. They have all their Nike golf shirts ready to go, and they just disappear. They just kill over in the hotel room, maybe. Or on the back nine. Right. <laughs> How is Vegas living there, though, as a, as a local? I mean, it's great. Comparatively to places I've lived in the past, it's, th it's the best place I've lived. But in what way? Like, how is it? Is it just uh, that you like this stage your life is in? Or is it truly good? Or maybe it's a mix of both? I think it's a, it's a mixture of cost of living, weather, community and people food food is a huge one really like and i realized this when i was back in san diego like there's a huge difference yeah. between the quality and the availability of different types of food in san diego than in vegas yep. for the sole reason 
of it's so cheap and easy comparatively to run a business, a small business in Vegas than it is in San Diego. Like the rents are cheaper and affordable for a business. Like you can have a, a very niche food shop in Vegas and survive and potentially thrive if you have, you know, if you're smart with social media and like there's, you know, one off like Dole Whip shops or like, you know, one off, um, you know, like artisan donut shop. It's like, you know, places that you would never think that would actually thrive. And then they have lines around the block. And a lot of places, there's, there's endless small shopping malls in Vegas. So there's endless small, like these food places to try. So it's been, I, I love it because it's like, you can try so many different things in different places for relatively cheap. And, you know, that fast casual style of, of dining, which is you know, 99% of the, t you know, when I eat out, that's what I eat out at. Right. Fast casual. Hmm. San like Diego does have some good restaurants though, but I, I, I think you're right. I don't think it's the quality of, of, uh, even Austin or Houston has amazing food. Mm -hmm. They have an I, amazing restaurant scene. I think it's just the, the quantity there's so there's so it's, I mean, it's endless strip malls all around Vegas and in Henderson. So regard, like no matter where you live, pretty much you're going to be close to a strip mall that has like a good Mexican spot, a good Chinese mm -hmm. spot. Like a good sandwich spot. Yeah. I, so, and it's, it's funny though, because you know, what makes a restaurant good is like, is interesting because I was talking about this this weekend because, you know, we went to black radish, right. And the last time I was there, it was incredible, right. It was a great experience. We came at the right time. Like, I think it was like seven or something. And, uh, engaged with like the server or the, the waiter and really it was a great experience but this time you know multiple things went wrong we got there later uh they were like 30 minutes from close which wasn't great i did not feel good about that but it's and they also changed their menu you know um but yeah it, it's hit or miss sometimes like you have to be in the right state of mind and it, 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 the, the you have to get a waiter who's you know engaging with you and stuff and it'll be like an amazing i guess my point is like the experience you get just depends sometimes on like so many other factors other than just the food. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and what you, uh, and what you prioritize. So like for yes. me, the top priority is essentially the quality versus the price of what I'm paying for. Oh, and then quantity is probably right below that. Cause I don't want to like, I don't eat at, McDonald's burger. Like I don't eat at fast food places like that anymore. Cause I know Same. that that is just like, it's just bad quality for the price where comparatively for about the same price, I can go somewhere else and get something relatively similar for a much higher quality. Mm -hmm. Our burgers is a, as a good example of this. They're like a local diner spot. I think we went there one, uh, when you guys came into town. And that's the one we were, uh, with the chicken, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And you can get like a, a burger, two chicken tenders and French fries for like $8 out the door. And the quality of all the stuff is really incredible. Like it's never frozen chicken. They fry the chicken right there in the store. It was, um, good. like the burgers are cooked fresh. Everything is fresh and it's good. And it's like, okay, that is, and it's $8 for all that comparatively to the same price of what you would get at, you know, more of a traditional fast food. Um, but a lot, it, I think a lot of people get thrown off because of the drive through aspect. And I think that's something that's very much a Vegas thing, or it's not a San Diego thing, but it's very much a, a Vegas thing of, um, because of the heat, like just having drive throughs in more places allows people to just get food without having to get out of their car when it's 120 degrees. Oh yeah. That is a good point. I never thought of that, but that that's like Texas. Yeah. Does Texas have a lot of uh, drive throughs as well? Yeah. I mean, it's a very big car culture state. Yeah. You do everything in your car, eight lane highways and all that eight lane high. Yeah. 16. I mean, there's, there's one in Houston that I believe has eight on each side, maybe 10. Yeah. It's insane. And I think only LA has highways as big. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then every, 
every possible food food spot on on you know on the interstate could be could be had and i think yep. did you see that video of of uh wendy's wendy's added the ai in their drive through no no do they have that now i've seen ai in drive throughs i saw it the other day in san diego when i went to um, really yeah like two or three months ago actually now that i think about it and this was at uh oh, it's a burger place that they don't have in texas did you but do it mm-hmm. yeah it was great it did every i even told it like I even said, like, I modified the burger basically and said, oh, just no pickles or something. And it got it perfect. Really? Yeah, let me figure out what that was. Is like Hardy? It... Let me see. Hmm. But yeah, how's the Wendy's AI? Here, I'll, I, I'll have it. Welcome to Wendy's. What would you like? Can I have a chocolate frosty? <laughs> Which size for the chocolate frosty? Medium. Can I get you anything else today? No, thank you. Great. Please pull up to the next window. <laughs> Fresh AI. Wow. Interesting. I mean, that's perfect, though. Perfect use case. Perfect use case. I mean, it's exactly what it's great at, and they have all the technology. Let's see what that was. Be curious to see what the contract of Fresh AI and Wendy's is like. Mm hmm. Knowing, knowing everything that we know for a large corporate deal for something like that, it's probably low to mid six figures minimum i would i would expect i have no idea actually i would think it would be more i mean because probably more because that's all custom i mean you saw it popping up on their screens they had to roll it out to select stores that's a good question and and fresh ai is it's like let's see it was oh it was carl's jr ah and they had something very, very similar, very similar. So I wonder if that was fresh AI also. Maybe. Once they, uh, once they add in AI and then they add in robots just to, to cook the burgers. It mm -hmm. I mean, I think fast food is going to be the first industry to go full AI robotic full, like fully, like there might be one or two people in there to just manage manage uh you know manage stuff but i think that that will be fully automated so quickly i think you're right in fact i don't remember if it was onan or d on group chat that was talking about i think it was onan right who was talking about that he's invested in um some company that's automating oh yeah uh chipotle bowls yep Yep. And they also have other things they've already automated, which is like R mark or something, you know, like, uh, like when you're at like, a, what is it called? Like, you know, like at school, whenever mm -hmm. you go in and you have like a, not a cafe, I can't remember the word, but I mean, that's perfect to automate those. Yeah. And it's like those, those things that are simple to, uh, to learn. It's a perfect example for Ella. And I was just pulling up the tweet from Sam Altman. He said, learning how to say something in 30 seconds that takes most people five minutes is a big unlock. Like, what does he mean by that? I, I saw that and I was just like, what? And, and he said, for what it's worth, this is basically how LLMs work. And I think this is something that I, I try to do, especially when talking to clients is they'll say what they're interested in or, or what they, what they want or what they are the idea that they have. Mm -hmm. And then I'll re repeat their idea back to them in a way that's grounded in reality rather than in whatever is, you know, whatever the fantastical idea might be or could be. And it's just like kind of recontext, uh, contextualizing what they're saying in a simpler, like the whole explain it like I'm five. Oh, is that what he means with that tweet? I think so. I mean, that's, that's the way I interpret it is like, how can you, 
simplify a complex topic for someone quickly. Well, and, that is a good skill. I mean, we, we do do that quite a bit with things like that. Because I mean, you know, like, like you said, like, you know, a customer will come and say, yeah, just through necessity, spend two or three minutes explaining mm -hmm. what a very complicated thing that they've said. And then we just say, oh, you mean like this? You're saying, yeah, still a weird tweet, though, because I thought it was just worded kind of strange. Yeah. But I, it, it's a good example, though, of, of also how I think AI in general is going to start to get rooted in people's minds of what this stuff actually does and how it works. And Agreed. I think it's going to be as commonplace as any other technology we're kind of using. And, and there'll be certain use cases, you know, that it's perfect at and that it's appropriate for that use case. Mm -hmm. I don't know yet if AI is going to just take over every single job. I mean, not, not with its current state, that's for sure. And it's going to be super interesting to see. I think GPT-5 is either going to, if it's amazing and incredible and like, it's like, you know, a whole next level compared to a four, then people are going to be like, oh yeah, AI is going to take over all jobs, blah, blah, blah. But if it's just iteratively better, just like a little bit better and still like certain use cases it can't handle, I think people will be like, okay, well, yeah, we're safer. I, in the grand scheme of things, I think we're still so early. Like I think so. It's it's incredible to see the the progress that other models have made in the last three to six oh, months, yeah. and yeah. and starting to de, you know dethrone uh, GPT in terms of absolutely like yeah. Claude. I use it daily for various things. Now, the, and the weirdest thing is like it all depends on your use case. Like I will use. So GPT, I realized Claude's cutoff date is like 2021, Opus, Claude Opus. Mm. Um, and so that eliminates it for some of the stuff I want to use it for where there's been changes. Like it, we use it for coding stuff, right? Like, hey, look up this or tell me how this command works in Linux. And if it doesn't have that, you know, if, th if something's changed recently, I would rather go to GPT-4 because it has more knowledge, more recent knowledge. Mm -hmm. But, and I'm definitely not at the, using AI like unedited. You see a lot of people on like Twitter or, or even, even like with LinkedIn posts and stuff like I showed you the other day where it's clear they're using GPT and not even four. It's like clear they're just using 3.5, barely editing it and just releasing it. And it's just like, come on guys, you got to use it to like, you can't just tell it, hey, go write this. Yeah. You know? You have to like, I, what I often do is like record my stuff as a human and then I give it to either Claude or, or GPT and I say either how can you improve this or how's the grammar or just, you know, improve this period. Like mm -hmm. I can literally give Claude improve this colon and then all the transcript of me saying something ranting it and it does a pretty good job of like making it more, you know, appropriate. Have you ha have you had to put in uh, custom instructions to not say delve? <laughs> no, but I need to do that. So, are you using the? So, are you using the custom GPTs? Not the custom GPTs, but just the custom instructions or whatever that morphed into. I always, I always, I had put in there like. Um, what is that now? Let me see. I mean, I think it's still there. How do you do it? Just go to settings. I think it's settings. Yeah. Settings. No, that's my sidekick. Maybe they got rid of it. Let me see. I'm just wondering now. Personalization. Oh yeah, customized GPT. Customized chat GPT. Let me see. So custom instructions. Oh, okay. So I have like a bunch of, um, I'll just show you. Okay, yeah, please. I see. Why so, have I never used this? In in the in your settings, customize Chat GPT. Mm -hmm. There's custom instructions, but then there's also how would you like Chat GPT to respond? So I gave it when generating HTML code, always provide mm -hmm. it in a single code block because like that that's how I use it to generate code for GHL. Yep. But then I was also like I, when you write, I was like avoid fancy jargon, avoid using all these words that are what 
AI is known f- to use, like delve, all these random yep. uh, adjectives that don't mean anything. This is beautiful. I'm gonna start using this today. Realm, tailored, tailor, tailored. like, like there are just certain words like you, you, like everyone knows that GPT uses all the time. If mm-hmm. you just tell it to not use those words, then it doesn't use those words. <laughs> That's perfect. And you can put the and then and then and then custom. This applies to every new chat that you do. So it's almost you know comparatively to Stammer, it's like the 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 background based system prompt that gets added every single time without you having to add it. Right. Exactly. And this is where OpenAI is doing such a good job, I think, is because their chat interface, I actually don't mind using. Claude's, it, it's a little rougher, I think. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, I think it's what people are, are they've, they've become used to it. And we've mentioned this you know, a, a ton of times in the past where OpenAI is considered as the, the default uh, professor or teacher of the quote unquote AI market. And, you know, whether that's good or bad or whether that lasts f- till, you know, tomorrow, who knows, but as it stands right now, that's what people, that's what like the general public is starting to become aware of. And it's only going to grow. I, I got a text from my dad last night that 60 really? minutes was doing a whole thing on Nvidia and AI and everything. And who is, who watches 60 minutes? It's, not young people. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's like, and, and that's a whole new demographic that is now being exposed to what AI even is or what that term even means. I'd be curious to see what that, I, I know like maybe it was six months ago when we saw that stat, it was like 14% of the US has tried ChatGPT. I'd be curious to see what that stat is now. Yeah. I mean, I know kids are using AI like crazy. I mean, obviously ChatGPT, but other weird apps as well, like where they can make music and stuff like that. It'll make rap songs for them. Mm -hmm. All kind of weird use cases. It reminds me of the early app store days when there was apps for for like, um, you know, that did nothing except these kind of do something in certain ways. Like it may not be the best, but it's, it does it. Well, so like silly use cases. Yeah, remember silly that? Silly use cases, yeah. Well, and this this is actually one that actually had a purpose, but remember how there didn't, there wasn't a flashlight originally. The flashlight. Like you, had, yeah. you had to have an app. <laughs> the, uh, the beer, the beer one where you could like have the beer oh. or the drink and you could go like this and it would, it would pretend like you're drinking it like a magic trick. Like that is such early, early, like, you know, now yeah. that's just a joke of like, you know, cause everyone's aware of like, oh, that's not magic, you know? But like back mm-hmm. then it was like, how is it even doing that? Accelerometer, like an accelerometer? What's an accelerometer? <laughs> yeah, you're right. It was that phase where the technology was like new. Like the term accelerometer did not exist. Uh, I mean, at least, I mean, I'm sure it, in, I mean, in it must have. Common, yeah, I mean, common term jargon, yeah. uh, you know. At least, you know, to a 15 year old's ears, that was new. <laughs> yeah. At the time. I think you're right. I didn't even think about that. You're right. That, that is the stage we're in where AI itself is so new that it almost experiencing just that technology itself, not even with a real use case, is so interesting, you know? And it's going to provide so much like knowledge and just insights, I think, into the future of how business is done in an online space. So it's like, if you have any interest in getting into making money related to online projects or endeavors, like having AI be at the forefront of that mindset is only going to be beneficial. Exactly. I mean, people that are getting in now, it's, it's going to be, it's like, literally it's like the web. It's a, the early days of the web type situation here. Yeah. And it's crazy to think that we're saying that now, and we've been in it for almost a year. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I'm just glad we we got started when we did. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, it's going to slowly just change everything, and and the real question is going to be, what will it not impact and change? 
but mm -hmm. businesses that have no idea how to implement this stuff. And we've talked about this before, especially on the office hours calls that we do for Stammer, but you know, learning how to prompt an AI is going to be an incredibly valuable kind of skill. Mm -hmm. Because I think that I think that's going to become the preferred interface. Because if you think about it, and it was talks with the customers in Discord that were like making me think this, but so many kids these days have no like computing skills. They've not, they don't even use websites. They use apps, you know. Mm -hmm. And the ability to go and like browse a website and, and to like search it in order to find the information you're looking for, they're not going to have those skills they're not going to want to do that. And so what are they going to do? They're going to go straight to the chat bot and start talking to the chat bot. And so every business is going to need, it may get to the point where web pages are, you know, where you don't have a lot of front facing web pages. Maybe it's just a landing page. Um, and behind the scenes you have, you know, your knowledge base or whatever, which answers all these questions, but maybe the primary interface will become some type of chat bot, you know, some type of AI agent. Mm -hmm. Because, oh yeah, because I don't browse documentation. Like I, ne for one thing, I didn't do it even when I was coding because no one likes to read a whole site full of documentation, but now I certainly don't use it, right? Just go and ask the AI. Yep, exactly. I think that's gonna be the, the primary thing that people do these days. I think there's some, given something to be said about growing up using Windows <laughs> before using Mac, before using apps yep like no but no why? uh well I, I mean i i first used windows 2000 then i became like i started building pcs when i was a kid on xp so xp was like my first like okay i know what i'm doing with uh you know, like loading a, a BIOS and, and yep. all those things, like overclocking CPUs and things. Um, and then Vista 7. And then I think when Windows 8 is when I switched over to Mac. And what were your first impressions? Well, it was because I was working on the app at the time. So right. it was like, oh, I need, at the time you were required to own, talk about a, a MLM that's not an MLM. <laughs> Apple required you to have a Mac to have Xcode in order to be able to develop uh, uh, an iPhone app. So it's like you had to have a Mac to build an iPhone app. And if so- I think you, that makes sense though. I mean, it- Well, at the time, I mean- yeah. I basically was like, oh, I, I, in order for me as a teenager to break into this market, I somehow have to figure out how to get a $2,000 laptop Right. <laughs> yeah. as a 15 year old, you know, and you know, my, you know, snack bar hustle has only got me so far. <laughs> uh, but so once, you know, once I found a company that would be like, oh yeah, yeah, here's a computer to build it and I'll figure it out. I was like, oh, now the, now the gates are wide open. Now let me see what I can what I can do and then and then realizing that just like the user interface like all the things that I think in my opinion Mac does as, well. as as a as a power user just over overruled the BS at the time that seven and eight and and Vista or I mean yeah Windows seven and eight at the time were were going through and it's just like oh this is and I just and I stopped gaming so there was there was other things I think in in play there that made me stop going to a PC. I stopped building PCs. So yeah, and I can't even. I'll, I I'm to the point now where I've been using Macs exclusively for like a decade, maybe a little bit longer. But it's just an overall like a p more polished experience mm -hmm. using it. And then as a developer, there's some advantages to that underlying OS because it is a, a Linux like OS. You know, it's a it's POSIX compliant, as far as I remember. I think it's a variant of like BSD. Um, anyway, yeah, it, so it has all the Linux commands it supports. Now that being said, rarely are you like running. Well, yeah, I, I have, we do run Stammer locally actually, and it is literally using 
the Linux features of the OS pretty well. So I was going to say that, you know, usually you put it in some type of environment on your local machine. But yeah, we do literally, I do literally run it on the, uh, the OS. But anyway. So should we go through some questions, do you think? Do you want to go through some questions that some of the customers have asked? Sure. Yeah, let's get do it. Your, that could be a that here. could be a good way to end end our end our episodes. Oh, you think so? Going through questions? Maybe. I was just trying to think of a way instead of us being like, "Are we done?" Like, have a <laughs> have, have like. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, there are multiple different podcasts. I'll have different versions of this where. Right. You just have like a recurring segment almost at the end of your show or episode where. People, then it's like, oh, people know that we're kind of ending things up. I don't know. Yeah, I think we should. I think we should start with like news and stuff like that and go into, you know. News and content, because I, I think yeah. ha- talking about content is also super interesting, just like all the different threads and shows and tweet like that. That part, I think, of pop culture and streaming, I think, is still relevant. Yeah. In, in some ways. Like, I don't know, like the stuff we were talking about, like the big short or not the big short, the, the social network and. Yeah, it really is. And all that. But, but yeah, what are you, what are the questions from the, from, from some customers? Yeah. Let's jump into it. Cause I've got several written down. So the, the biggest question that we get, and this is from what I've seen on both your YouTube content as well as mine. And one of the biggest questions is like, how do I start a service based business? Which, which is a huge question, obviously, but I'm sure a lot of people, especially our customers and maybe people even watching this podcast, where would you start? Like where would, like some guy walks up to you on the street and says, I want to start making money online. Where would you have someone start? Do you think? Yeah, I would, I would try to advise them to, to pull on past experiences. Like, what do you know? What Mm. are you familiar with? There's a, there's a really good interview question, I think from uh chamath Paliapatia from all in podcast where he was like one of my favorite interview questions is asking a person in the interview to tell tell you mm-hmm. explained t- to me in something that you like that you know extremely well in extreme detail just anything like it could be mm-hmm. a tv show it could be a sport anything and explain it to me in extreme detail like something that you actually like and it's just like an interesting way of like how can this person take a concept almost like what Sam Altman was saying, like how can they take this large concept that they know a lot about and can, and can condensely explain it in a short, a period of time and have it, that make sense. And that I thought was a really interesting question that you could ask a potential person in an interview just to gauge, I think their, you know, aptitude for, communication i guess right um so a a long way of saying of just like what it is what is something that you know well if you have if you you know worked a couple summers mowing lawns as a teenager then you know something about the landscaping business if you worked you know for a packaging company you know something about the logistics and shipping business Um, you know, or worked for a warehouse. Like if you worked at a bakery, there's local, like there's, what do you know? Like (laughs) we got to start with something. So start with something like some, some sort of past experiences. And then through that process, you typically find a problem that you can solve. So when you're going through that process, you're like, oh my gosh. Yeah. When I was mowing lawns, it was super tough to get new clients. Mm. Ah, great. Okay. Well, here's a way to Make, and it's like, the, and that I think launches the kind of concepts because it's all rooted in something that you either know or are interested in and like. And it's a, it's so much easier to kind of talk about things and 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 avoid that um, imposter syndrome when you have a little bit of experience and knowledge about what it is that you're talking about. You're not just kind of making stuff up, you know, fake it till you make it. You're actually talking from experience. Right. In some way. 
And how did you make your first dollar online? Do you remember? Hmm. Aside from reselling stuff on eBay and, you know, like the, the, oh, the, right. the schemes I could do as a kid, basically the first like real money I made online was when, um, those hoverboards came out for the first time I was watching. I think this was 2014 or 2015. I was watching the Jack U Toronto express live stream which is a festival, uh, Diplo and Skrillex together as a duo, Jack U back in the day, they're like mm -hmm. a house, house duo. And Diplo was riding one of these hoverboards on stage. And it was the first time I'd ever seen them ever before. And I was like, oh my God, what is that? Like, what is this hoverboard? And um, this was in the early days of AliExpress, Alibaba, like becoming a thing with drop shipping and, and everything. So this is when Kyle and I were working at the vape shop. Mm -hmm. So we figured out where a supplier was of these uh, hoverboards called Mon And at the time there was actually a brand called Mono Rover. And we became a licensed distributor of Mono Rover out of our vape shop in Santa Clara. <laughs> and we imported, I think it was like 25 or 30, 30 of them. And I think it was my sophomore year of college, I would ride around to like house parties on a hoverboard. And I would just like, hey, you guys wanna try it out? And people were like, oh my God, no way, let me get one. I'm like, yeah, for sure. They're like 800 bucks. <laughs> and then people would buy them. And we sold so many of them. And then- What hoverboard? Like literally it was a hoverboard? Well, you know those ones I'm talking, like the two wheels that are like, you know, it's like a Segway oh. thing. Oh. Like those Segway things. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Okay. I didn't realize that that's what that was called. Okay. Yeah. So this was before they were at like Walmarts and things. This was like when they were brand, brand, brand spanking new. Right. And so we started importing them from this company, Monorover, which had a distributor in China. So we, you know, we would buy, we would buy them for like 160, 180 bucks, but you have to buy, you know, 15, 20 of them at a time. But then we would flip them immediately on Craigslist or, or I mean, and we just sell them out of our vape shop. So I guess not technically online dollar, but like that was the first like online hustle that I was like, oh, we can, cause we got list, we got listed on Mono Rover's website as a licensed distributor. Really? So like we wow. had people coming to us and be like, oh, like let me buy one and where's, where can I pick one up? Oh, this, this address in Santa Clara, <laughs> it's a vape shop. <laughs> vape shop. So yeah, the, and those things lasted for forever. Really? Think, yeah, yeah. I don't. I got. I got rid of mine because mine was literally falling apart. But the battery still worked. The motor still worked. The, gy the gyros. Everything. Everything still worked. Yeah, that's pretty good. Hmm. Yeah. I guess the better the better answer would be through the through the online side of the vape shop when we started pushing the online sales. That was like our true right. first online online dollars. And then when did you start making websites for other kind of businesses? And how did you get into right, that? Right right during that period. Cuz we were like we made a website for selling hoverboards. We would make a website for selling vape. We would make a website for like selling t-shirts or whatever hustle it is that we were trying at the time. We were like, oh, let's just make a website for this. And so my partner, Kyle, and I at the time, we were like, we both became really good at building websites really quickly. Mm -hmm. And then we became proficient in WordPress. And I mean, we had, we had back in the day, we were on Joomla. Uh, really? One of the original sites was based on Joomla. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Wow. Then WordPress, then, then Shopify, then Webflow then GHL, like it just kind of kept progressing of like which platform are people using and which is the cheapest for us to make quality stuff that could still make us money. And uh, now, yeah, now we're at GHL. <laughs> yeah. And for most of your customers, would they would you charge them like a recurring kind of monthly no. fee? No, and, and Kyle and I were laughing about this. i more now. But we were, so we saw this, we, um, we came across some competitor. Yeah. I mean, I, 2016, 2015, 2016, probably. 
And this guy was charging 250 bucks a month for like unlimited website design and updates yep. and everything. And we're like, this dumb motherfucker, like, oh, this guy can't make any money. And in hindsight, you're like, God damn, that's the smartest move. Cause that guy got everyone locked in, got his, got the sites built. And then, yep. you know, quickly. And once we, once we started using GHL, we quickly moved to that model very quickly. And I mean, MRR skyrocketed, like everything just skyrockets immediately because it's a better offer for the end client. Instead of a $3,000 upfront charge, it's 300 bucks a month and they get whatever they need. And the key here that I realized, it's not necessarily about the actual deliverable, it's about the communication. The people are paying right. for communication, not the actual, the website is the, the and. What they're paying for is the ability to know that they have a website guy or an online guy. Right. If they have problems or in a question or something, they know that they can email you or text you or call you and that you'll actually respond within a reasonable amount of time. I've gotten yep. so many clients that have had bad experiences with other agencies that just come back to us because they know that I will respond simply for that fact. Yep. And same honestly, product, think, same product, GHL, but, but they come to us because they know that we'll respond. Yep. And that you can, and if you don't know, if you don't have the ability to do something, you can at least direct them to someone who does, you know, exactly, which I've point done them in the right direction. Yeah. Numerous times. And I don't think people realize like how much you can charge. And it's not, it's going to sound bad. Like when I say how much you can charge, but I know a business right now, dentist office paying like 700 a month for their website and just keeping someone like kind of on retainer, like you're describing. And yeah, some months I'm sure they have quite a bit of stuff they have to do, but not, not a ton, you know, they just like to have someone who can handle all that. And, and business owners don't want to handle any of that. They don't want any to run. It, it, and it's so it's such a little cost when you have all these other expenses, you know, and the website is like such an important thing, right? That's how most businesses these days are getting their prime. That's their primary funnel, right? Yeah. And I can almost guarantee that the owner of that business went through two or three people that were bad that they then arrived on this person and was like, oh, yeah, I'm OK yep. paying a premium because they actually do respond. They give me good information. Good like. That's the value of being a good agency. Like for everyone out there that's trying to start an agency, that's the main thing that you need to focus on is providing good client communication. And and how do you do that? Like, is it just like, I, yeah, let's talk about that. Like obviously yeah. answer your emails quickly, right? As quickly as possible. Every Everything needs to be responded to within 24 hours minimum. I try right. to do everything like within an hour because I'm yep. crazy. But um, emails should always be responded to. Like I, I try to always be the last person on the thread to respond. So that mm. way I'm always leaving the last impression or last good impression. Um, sometimes I don't do it. So if you're listening to this and I didn't respond to your email, I'm sorry, but, uh, I just, <laughs> he doesn't like you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, um, no, I'm just kidding. So yeah, email is good. I try to, I try to keep my f personal phone number, private, but it's so useful to have the ability to just text and respond. It's, and it's one of those, it's a, it's a care, it's a fine line and you can do this with a business phone. So it's like, you know, now you get a business line and a personal line and then there you go. Same kind of true. Same, that's a good point. same idea. You can give that out. And ideally that's what you should do because with things like mint mobile, now you can get uh, phone numbers for like $10 a month. So it's, that's not a big issue, but just that it's the access, having the access. Are you willing to give that out? And from my experience, if you give it out and you respond, like the, because they know that you'll respond, they're not gonna hit you up all the time because they don't wanna be dealing with text messages all the time. Just like anybody, right. just, just like anybody else. And then obviously like, you know, um, Zoom calls and things whenever requested from from people that are paying for for that type of support. The one the one I, I would be careful of, and this is I, I mentioned this to another colleague, um, is public channels of communication where they're open for anybody. And that's that can be tricky because it really depends. And I think we're starting to see this with 
with discord with uh people joining that aren't necessarily even remotely related to ai or any like you know business or anything like just you know spammers and things like that um which just drain just adds to support time which drains which adds to support costs and and all the things um yeah, that's true. Although we haven't we haven't really had too much to be honest. I mean, this this morning we literally had someone spamming adult content on the thing, but it it was dealt with really quickly and I'm surprised we don't have a lot more of it, I guess. Yeah. True. Hmm. But but yeah, I mean, we do uh, and I think one thing we see overall, like, do, do you agree that there's a lot more agencies these days than there used to be? I mean, the market is growing, right, overall? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, when I started Site Right and we were like a website development agency, agent, right. it, the agency market wasn't necessarily a thing. It was more of like a, oh, I do paid ads or I do SEO. The agency side was kind of the secondary thing. What I think really, I truly, and this is kind of ridiculous, but um, there's a couple influencers that released courses about how to start your own SMMA agency, Mm -hmm. social media marketing agency. And those went crazy viral. And I think that really influenced a lot of people to start researching what this agency topic even was and how the online hustle is not drop shipping, selling stuff or whatever, it's providing services to others through software that you know better than that other person and, right. and different ways to, to do that. And a lot of that started out with uh, social media planners, um, tools like, um, uh, there's, there's, uh, buffer there's so many all, all those all those like scheduling apps and in a lot of the early days of social media marketing was just setting that stuff up and then implementing it for a business and then charging some amount of money and then it graduated towards the dm strategies of the social media automation strategies where then you leveraged many chat to then do automations based off of uh opt-ins or or different dm sequences or comment sequences Mm -hmm. and that's now since graduated to basically full-on ghl which is everything under under the sun of what a potential local business could want or need in terms of an online experience because they're again like what you said they're not the ones dealing with it and running it the agency person is and when they need something done they just hit up the agency owner and they have i need this done right and you recommend so so do, do you recommend all new agency owners price things in like a recurring subscription type model? It depends on your market, but I think it's worth testing both because you might, mm. you might come to find out that your type of clientele is used to paying a six or $7,000 upfront charge plus a lower, I mean, the, the goal should always be to have some sort of recurring revenue yeah in any capacity i think the question is more about how big or if at all you have this kind of like setup fee or one-time fee um which could drastically increase or or decrease the the overall lifetime value of a customer or client and that is directly correlated to the value that you're providing and how would you recommend they price it like let's say because one thing I'm realizing, and it's silly, I'm just realizing this while we're doing this podcast, but you're in a very unique position in that, you know, you can reveal things about how to start an agency business that others can't in some ways, because it's not your, our, it's not our primary way of making money at this point, you know? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't have a dog in that fight anymore. Exactly. And like, you are not competing with the people that are stammer customers, basically. Exactly. So how so, would you price, how would you recommend they price it? Like say, because a new guy is just starting out, he knows how to build websites, maybe with GHL or maybe some other technology. Regardless, how can he price his product? Or, or would 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would I would take a look at uh, Hermosi's example of using the like three or five. There's like three, three or four or five things. Urgency. Uh, okay. Limited time, like a time, time, limited time offer. Um, it's all about how you're making that that million dollar offer that is irresistible. There's a couple of different things, and I forget all all the different things. But um, once you place all those things together within the context of whatever it is that you're doing, so within the example of a website deal there's a significant amount of work up front that provides value to the customer or the client. Mm -hmm. And if that is worth a lot of money to the customer, then you could easily charge that to that customer. If you're just getting started, you could say that that's what you're going to charge them and then be like, hey, because you're one of my first customers, I'm not gonna charge you that to help me get a bigger portfolio. And I think that's, a, that's the way I initially got started was just taking a lot of lower cost deals to build up a portfolio of Got it. clients that I could then leverage and be like, Hey, this client paid me a lot of money. And if you want something like this, it's, this is what it costs. Cause then they have a reference. There's an anchor. There's something to compare it to where they have a reference of, you know, there's context of what they're going to pay is what they're for what they're going to get. Got it. That makes sense. So what you're describing or what it sounds like you're saying to me is, if you're new, in some ways, start off, char you know, start off charging what you can charge in some ways in order to get these deals and build up kind of a portfolio of clients. And over time, your pricing will kind of reveal itself over time. And as you get better, you'll start to be able to charge more. Is that kind of what you're saying? High level, yeah. The, I, I'm such a big advocate of people signing up for Upwork to, when they first get started because it really shows you what businesses yeah. are willing to pay for this, for anything, for this type of website work, ads, any, everything and anything related to online stuff. That's a very good point. And I did the same thing. And I, I've said this so many times to so many different people. Um, when I needed to make money or I was like, oh, I'm, you know, I need to make rent. Yep. I would go to Upwork and then I would just sit there and apply to jobs for a f couple hours and then, you know, all these different $300 job, a $1,000 job, a $200 job. And over the course of a couple of weeks after completing several of those jobs, your account starts to show that you have dollars earned, you have reviews, you have ratings, which then allows you to increase the amount that you have on your profile, which allows you to negotiate a higher amount on the job. So like if someone lists it for 200, you'd be like, yeah, okay, that's 200 for the first hour <laughs> or something versus 200 for the entire job. And that's to a T, literally exactly how I think how every single person who starts on Upwork and then eventually goes off of Upwork yep. starts, starts their agency because then they'll start to get a ton of referrals because they provide a good work. So business owners know other business owners who then are like, oh, do you have a website guy? Oh yeah, let me, let me give you this guy's contact info. And then it starts to scale from there to the point where then you never even have to go back to Upwork. It, it then just becomes a, an added lead gen bonus if you ever need it. Absolutely. And I don't think people realize this, but like, so even working, when I was working for a major tech company, you know, last year, we used Upwork, <laughs> like literally. I found an agency to run ads for a, a product test we were kind of doing and found that through Upwork. So their enterprises are using Upwork. like. And the agency we hired, they, they were great. I think they honestly could have charged quite a bit more and, and maybe didn't realize it or, or maybe they figured we, they would get it later on through us by, keep, by using us, but they were great. I mean, they were fantastic. They handled everything for us. Um, so not only is it SMBs that you can get on Upwork, it's also major enterprises as well. Mm -hmm. There's actually a separate enterprise kind of area of Upwork where Upwork assist the enterprise companies more. So people will kind of actually go mm. through job postings for you, find stuff, and they'll kind of filter out. And they, they actually have like a, I think it's another tier of Upwork that you as a, what do they call it whenever you're a, is it a client or what is it when you're doing jobs yeah. for? A client, it's, and you're a client or a freelancer. Right. Is the way they say it. 
they have a higher tier of freelancer. I can't remember what it's actually called, but if you can get to that tier, then they many times will kind of, you know, show you to these enterprise companies basically. Yeah. But yeah, it's amazing how big Upwork is these days. It's endless. There's so much opportunity there. It's crazy. I'm surprised that company's not bigger, to be honest, now that I think about it. What is their value? Let me see. Uh, I can't find any information about that. Oh, that's pretty big. 1.5 billion. <laughs> if that's Just accurate. Cash 1.5 B. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, Upwork then is a great way to kind of get started as a, as a new agency owner and massive amount of people on there, including massive enterprises and stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. So here's, here's another question we often get, and this is a huge question as well, but, and I think it's related to Upwork basically what you were just saying, but like, how do you get clients? So you've talked about this before, like, let's say they get on Upwork. What would you suggest they do? Start applying for, for jobs within your niche. So if you're a website, if you're going to go and start building out websites, mm -hmm. search for a website and then just start applying for all the most recent jobs that are even remotely, you know, decent. The hit rate, the hit, and this is, I think, where people use, uh, you, you, I, this is, I, I fell victim to this too. Like you right. apply to 50 jobs, you get no responses, no offers, no nothing back. You're like, ah, this mm -hmm. is not working. And then you give up. Where Upwork really comes into play is when you apply to 150 jobs and one or two people respond back in a message to you and then you start the conversation and then you get on a Zoom call or a, you know, book a meeting and then, and then you close a deal. So it's like you really have like the grit of going through hundreds of failures or the work that it takes to apply to that many things, to that many jobs. That's what, that's the hard work that when you're starting out, you can do yourself for free because you have no other choice. So like right. when I was struggling, like I would just sit there like on a, you know, on a Saturday night and just apply to Upwork jobs for like five hours. And I would apply to hundreds of jobs. But af after that, you know, the following Monday, I would have 15 plus DMs about jobs and opportunities and like, okay, now I know how I'm gonna pay for rent and food for the next month. like all these jobs. Yeah, that's, that's pretty powerful to me because I mean, we've talked about this before and there's a ton of kids out there that are, you know, and I call them kids, but a ton of people getting out of college and, you know, they're working some corporate job and they're realizing like the truth about big corporate, which I know because I, I spent a decade over a decade in that situation, but you know, it sucks. It, it, it does not, it's not inspiring, you know, to be part of a, a team that's, especially of a big corporation. It's not inspiring. People are, you know, we, there's a ton of people out there that are just like, how can I kind of do my own thing? And I talked about this on Twitter. So have you, I've seen you talk about it with your content, but like starting an agency or starting an online business, a service-based business, it's a great way to like get your feet wet with entrepreneurship. Yeah. It's the best way because you start to figure out how to talk with clients. You figure out what an invoice is, sending payment links, like taxes. Like <laughs> there's so many things about growing. And I, I'm so thankful that I've gone through, through those, through, through that numerous times already. Right. And failed numerous times to know what not to do. Failing forward always. And realizing that, you know, that, that business experience carries forward to every, everything. So like talking with your Upwork clients now on DMs helps you 10 years from now because, you know, you're now you're doing outbound sales to clients for some reason. You know, it's like everything's related to, to each other as long as you stick with it and are consistent. Yeah. And what is like the biggest tip you would give 
someone wanting to start an agency today? What's something you wish you would have known years ago? Hmm. I mean, I, I think I knew, I knew it. I just waited a little bit longer, but it's just starting to create content. Mm. And I remember thinking, I was like, oh, uh, I need to work at this for a couple of years before I have the audacity to go out there and start making content to make it seem like I know what I'm talking about. And is that true? No, not at all. What I realized is as long as you are documenting rather than creating, like that can go so far. And we're seeing this right now go extremely viral with content creators like Sam Soyuk and um, yep. Brandon Davis, the, the locked in guy. Like it's just organic content that is authentic. And that's it. Like, and it's just people connect with it because they're like, oh yeah, I'm also going through that similar thing. And it's not overly edited. It's not, you know, overly produced or anything. It's just documenting your day-to-day -day life. And that is starting to connect with other people. And I wish I had done that sooner where I was documenting my struggles and, and my, you know, all the things that I was going through at the time that I was going through it because other right. people are going through that same thing. It huh. becomes a whole different conversation and ball game after you have a bunch of followers Every, all that advice I give now is going to fall on deaf ears because, oh, you have all the followers, you have all the, whatever. But like, I remember the time before I had, all, before that success came where it was a struggle and you still had to keep like, you know, it wasn't a guarantee that it was going to work or, or work out. And I think, and that's, again, just like with Upwork, you got to just keep posting. Right. Be consistent. And I'm struggling with this right now. <laughs> right. Yeah, we were talking. Yeah. But you got it. Like, that's the thing. You, the more you show up, the more that you're, uh, you know, top of mind of people. Like, yeah, you got to just keep posting. The There's never going to be. And the, I, the other thing, I'll, and I was actually giving this advice to someone mm -hmm. in the run club over the weekend was mm -hmm. um, don't try to make content that you think is going to go viral or something that is like the the singular item that you should keep in in top of mind when creating content is what can i create that will get mm -hmm. other people to share it with their friends sharing sharing is the is the is the number one thing about how you can create content especially for short form on tiktok and instagram but how do you do that like what does that mean? Like, so you, yeah. you, you want to create content that is shareable? So, so a good example of this could be, so let's say I want to document what I'm going through and, and starting right. my agency. I could mm -hmm. film, uh, and I've done this in the past where I filmed like a time-lapse video of myself and I uh, tried to provide information or things I've learned from the agency. Like, oh, if you're, um, if you're trying to make, you know, social media content, you know, be consistent with posting or, you know, if you're running, uh, if you're doing SEO, you should have three to five keywords in your article or your, or your headline. And while that is useful advice, and this is mm -hmm. uh, other advice could be, you know, um, like business owner advice. It's like information that you and I would consider to be extremely valuable and useful, but the users don't find that useful because they're not familiar with that because they're not there yet. So like to them, it's just like, what is this guy even saying? Like, I don't like, okay, sending emails every day is a good thing. Like, why does that matter to me? Versus here's a really cool platform that allows you to send a million emails because that person who now is thinking, oh, my uncle runs a business and he was mentioning at dinner the other night that he does emails. Maybe I should send this video to him because he could potentially use that I, maybe he could use that. Right. And it's a, such a slight difference, but it's like what I found is it's, it's the information that's quick and accessible. And a lot of the time it's a website or a, a tool or a resource. Here's the thing that allows you to do the thing. And yeah. that allows people to share it with the person who they think of first when they see that. If it doesn't apply to them, they can send it to someone else. Like think of... Um, you know, for everyone listening, like if you have a parent or a friend or everybody, think of like the content that 
you get sent. And it's content that that person thinks you will be interested in. Right. That's the whole goal. Because now you've now you've essentially capitalized on two people watching your video from one person interacting with it. Or or you know, engaging organically. And that's that's the best type of engagement because it's organic. Someone is sharing a video to someone else who they think is gonna find it valuable. That person then clicks on the video, watches the video, and is like, oh, this person has good valuable content. Follow. Yep. That's how viral content gets you a ton of followers. That's how you can create content that will go nuclear. Got it. So basically what I've heard then is that you suggest that agency owners start making content, you know, ASAP, that even if, you know, they're just getting started, there's still a lot of value they can provide to others while promoting themselves. You know, that's, that's the benefit of that about just sharing their journey, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is in, that is that is really true, and we we see this with Stammer customers. To be honest, I mean Brock, what's his name? He's his YouTube channel is yes, and that was literally a, that was how I originally caught on to his content. Was I was like, this guy, excuse me, is so like organic and sharing the struggles aside from the facade that so many other YouTubers have, which is everything is gold and everything is I'm making unlimited money look at my Lamborghini, you know, it's like, what's the other side of this where everybody knows, <laughs> everybody knows everyone's aware of it, but no one talks about it because right. it's unsexy. But that is what I think we're seeing with this organic, authentic style of content push that we're seeing from a lot of different creators right now. And it's, and they're going mega, mega viral. Yeah. People are, people are done with the, the, you know, too polished. Too polished. Yeah, the Kardashian pol- over polished look. I think that's honestly a lesson for us as well. I mean, even even with this podcast, which is a bit meta to like talk about the podcast on the podcast, but we're still developing like what this is going to become. And I, I think the more we share kind of what we're working on, um, it's going to be it's only going to attract more people who are interested in that because we've got you know the agency side of things as well as the SaaS side of things because we're building you know stammer on the side plus the content the side, side of things like yeah. that's that's a whole that's a whole nother I had a buddy reach out to me who was asking for um, insights on one of my past posts because he was talking with a company and wanted wow. to showcase the value of user generated content for this massive company and like that's such an interesting insight that i think a lot of people are are i I, like no one really talks about that there's one uh colin and samir they have a podcast and youtube channel where Mm -hmm. they talk to other creators about like the behind the scenes of being a creator or an influencer or whatever you want to call it and it's always always and they talk to mr beast a lot it's always really interesting to see where where these other creators are. And I think we can take that within the context of the agency, the SaaS, the business owner, and start to do stuff within that, that realm as well. And I think that's where, we, that's where we'll see a lot of success with the in real life events. Oh, I think that's gonna, I think that's gonna be so key because I think you're absolutely right. I, I feel it in society now, there is a shift to where, and, and with Stammer, we're experiencing this now. We literally just got the devs uh, into they went back we're, we moved to a hybrid model so before all the devs were fully remote the dev team and uh, it was it was working well i mean we were getting you know code out but we were also hiring newer devs who don't have as much experience yet and we started thinking okay well maybe it'd be better if we moved to more of a hybrid model and so in the past week or two that's exactly what they've done and literally the first day the devs told us Hey, you know, this is a game changer. We're already communicating so much faster. It's just, it really is a a fact that there are some activities Mm -hmm. um, that benefit from being in person. It's a, it's going to be a, an epidemic of in real life events. I think that's going to be exactly like the last. So when last time I was at the run club, there was like four or five, six people maybe. And then Mm -hmm. I had my, got injured my hand with, Got nine stitches in my hand, three stitches in my knee, and 
month later, I come back and there's like 14, 15 people that show up. Really? Yeah. It's just like, whoa. You know, this is great. And you're, you're running, right? You're literally doing cardio, right? Well, this, this last one was a hike. So I think, you know, a little bit easier for different folk to, to join, which is great. Oh, I, okay. I definitely can't do the, do the running so much. I but hate running. I hate the car, but I could do a hike. That's for sure. The hike was nice. Yeah. Well, and, and running, I'll be rollerblading. So <laughs> where did you guys go on the hike? It was like, out, it looked beautiful. Yeah. It was out, out near Red Rocks. Oh, okay. So wow. yeah, really, really nice, beautiful, just open, open hiking area, some bouldering. Um, yeah. Trying to get out there before it gets to be too hot to go out there. Basically. There's a startup hike in Los Angeles that we should try to do some weekend. How far are you from LA? Like three or four hours. That's not too bad, but I may have to do it sometime because I, I think you're right about these in, in real life of IRL. Well, yeah, if I think you're it's only going to get bigger. Yeah, if you're there and you have a place to stay, like just do it, you know, go go for it. Yeah. Con- divide and conquer. Yeah, I think it's actually occurring in the city. So it's like on, you know, concrete. But still, I mean, that could be interesting to network with other people that are, you know, doing startup-y stuff. So. Maybe, maybe that's because I don't want to, I don't want to copy the stuff that the Run Club does, but maybe that could be like a core focus of whatever this business entrepreneur meet, meetup is, is like, there's some sort of physical activity involved, but it's not a run club. It's, you know, something a little bit easier, like hiking that would induce good conversation. I think hiking would. Yeah. And I mean, there's plenty of wherever we decide to do it, Vegas. I mean, we could, it could alternate, but if you do it in San Diego also, I mean, there's a lot of great places around here to hike. Endless places in San Diego. That Yeah. Anywhere in California, really. There's so many amazing. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. You know, one thing, Actually, one thing I suggest you do, because I think it's going to pump you up like so much, but, and I think your, your audience is so big that you could like literally get pe- like tons of people on, on, um, to do this with you. But one thing I started doing is that coffee and founder half hour again, mm-hmm. that I, that I used to do like two years ago. And all it is, is just like talking to a guy for 30 minutes. And sometimes I record it. Sometimes I don't, it's up to that viewer, what they tell me, but it's so cool. Like it's so inspiring. I didn't expect this, but it's like so inspiring talking to someone who's like brand new and just getting started building products or even like I talked to one guy who's building an agency, basically a data related agency. Uh, Stefan is his name. And it's, it's like so inspiring, like especially if they're just like getting started and we're kind of later in the stage at this point, but it's, it's, I don't know it, it like you're able to give them tips, you know, and, and actually, it's funny because I literally gave a dude the same tip that you just said a few minutes ago about, you know, hey, just get out there and start creating content because sharing your journey, even if you're early stage, it's still going to be very valuable to other people who are early stage. In fact, it may be more valuable than hearing advice from. Yeah, because it's current, dude. It's current. Yeah, it's what was, you're dealing with day in, day out. Yeah. Like yesterday, what do we deal with? Oh, that's what we can give you advice on today. Yeah, exactly. exactly. It always shocked me when in when in college, when I was in a you know this this short amount of advertising classes that I took, when I was mm-hmm. running Facebook ads while I was taking an advertising class, and the professor did not mention online ads a single time. That's I'm like, crazy. What are you doing? What is this class all about? I mean, and I think that's the that's the typical oh college whatever, but um, like with AI, it's times a hundred, times ten thousand with, with, in terms of like the speed and everything. Yeah. Hmm. So good stuff. This was a good one. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. We just got to keep, I think we just need to have more format. You know, we need to get a more solid format. Yeah, I agree. I'll work. We should both work on that and just come up with a, a, what would you call that? Almost like a framework or a it's just a segments. You, Which segments do we want to do? Yeah. We'll it's have like a list of segments. Intro segment. And this is I mean, just how group chat. They have an intro segment where they talk about their weekends or their lives. Then they mm-hmm. do news. Then they do the shout then they do the winners, losers content. Then they do shout outs. Like I can just off the top of my head from being a listener, I know the segments that they have, which means as a listener and viewer, I can I know what to expect. Yep. 
So it's like, I think if we have something to expect where for our users and um, we could also orient it to be more towards YouTube as well. So like we could do more stuff like where we're doing screen shares and showing the screen, putting the screen shares in there. Like, why not? That's a good idea. That's a really good idea, actually. But the main thing is we'll be consistent every Monday. We'll do this Nine and we'll, we'll get them out. Yeah, sounds good. Looking cool. forward to it. Yeah, all right. We'll talk to you guys next week. And I think week. next time, let's do like what you said next time. Let's uh, record it straight from the beginning. That way yeah. we get all the weird hellos and everything. The weird banter. That's because that's that's what I think is really good. There's another podcast, Rick Glassman. He's a comedian. Mm-hmm. Hilarious. He does the banter. Like as they're walking into his studio, you told me about he's that. recording. 